Welcome to this online lesson looking at how William governed England after the conquest. The aims of this lesson are to know how Norman England was governed and to assess the extent of change and continuity in Norman England. First of all then, let's consider the power of the king. King William was at the centre of all aspects of government and decision making. Followers were rewarded with land, not too much though, as otherwise they might become too powerful. This was different to the system under the Anglo-Saxon kings, where the most loyal followers were given an awful lot of land and frequently did become challenges to the king. Earls would be consulted about important issues, and most of the land was kept for William himself. This was known as the royal domain, the land being kept by king or lord for himself. King William would make sure he, followed, he showed himself off as a rich and magnificent and unchallengeable ruler. Your tasks him. Write your definition for the term royal domain. Explain how this is an example of the king's power. And which of the above examples are ways of keeping loyalty and how did they achieve this? Lastly, which examples show William showing off his power? And how did he do this? Pause the video now while you complete those tasks. So hopefully for royal domain we've got an idea that this is the land that's set aside for the king himself that he owns and he controls. This is an example of the king's power because it shows that land is being used as the main means by which he's controlling his followers. Which ways are, are examples of keeping his loyalty? Well firstly he's at the centre of government but he's rewarding people with the royal domain land that he controls. He does consult them on important issues though which makes them feel included in, in decision making processes. But really, it's about the idea that he's rewarding with them with land, but by extension, he can take that land off them if they are disloyal. How is he showing off his power then? Well, by taking ownership over virtually all the land of England as the royal domain that he then shares out, he's showing that he is the unchallengeable and unconquerable ruler. Also, by showing that he can take what he gives uh, for, to his followers away, he's showing that basically you have to do as William says or suffer the consequences. The power of the king can be summed up with a diagram much like this. It looks a bit like a target, doesn't it? But these concentric circles show the influence of power. At the top, or rather in the middle, we have the king. He's got the most power and all other power radiates from him. Then we've got the king's household. This includes the king himself, his family, the household knights and servants. These are the people that would have known the king personally the best because they lived with him and they had most private access to him. And then lastly, we have the court. This was the king's advisers, such as the chief landowners, who the king consulted. When we refer to the royal court, we mean the wider power structure of people who might come and go somewhat, but are still very close and loyal followers of the king that he relies on for advice and that share some of the decision making. Your tasks then. Firstly, copy down, the, down this diagram, concentric circles with these labels. Then, how might the household be important to the king? And secondly, what part of the feudal system would have made up the court? Consider why. If you've not done the lesson on the feudal system and about law, Norman society, it would be worth having a look at that first. Pause the video while you do these tasks. Okay, let's see what we can come up with. So first of all, the household might be important because these are the most personally known people to the king. So the people he really can rely on and trust the absolute most. This includes his family, who he might get advice from, but also support from, but also the most loyal knights for his own personal protection, and his servants who would provide things like his food and make him comfortable. All of these people would need to be trusted completely, because they had the most close access to the king, and therefore to be part of the royal household was an incredible honour. So what part of the feudal system would have made up the court? Well really this relates to uh, at the, the top level, the uh, tenants in chief. So the, the, these are the major landowners, owners, the barons and the, the big landowners. There might have been one or two knights in there, but really it's the tenants in chief who made up the court. Another aspect that we've considered before, particularly when looking at the revolt of the earls in 1075, is the role of regents and how important they were in running England. How could William rule from afar? William was Duke of Normandy as well as King of England, and really Normandy was his home. This meant that he spent about 80% of his reign in Normandy and not in England, which is a point that's often forgotten. William appointed regents to rule on his behalf. These were trusted supporters and friends who would run England when he was away, like his half-brother Odo of Bayeux, who's in the picture from the Bear Tapestry, and was probably the nobleman who ordered the tapestry to be made. His uh, best friend, William Fitzosborne, and Lanfranc, the Archbishop of Canterbury, 
who, of course, uh, introduced crucial reforms to the church and helped put down the revolt of the earls in 1075. Your tasks then. Define the term regent. Then secondly, what are the advantages and disadvantages of this way of ruling? Pause the video now. So hopefully we've defined regent as someone who rules the kingdom on behalf of the king while he's not there. But what are the advantages and disadvantages? Well, an effective regent like um, Lanfranc would be able to respond to events in England quickly without necessarily having to consult the king. This would allow rebellions, for example, to be put down effectively. However, there are disadvantages too. By relying on regents, you're putting an awful lot of trust into one person. If they become disloyal, that's a massive risk. Additionally, it may give uh, your um, people who might be rebellious towards you uh, some sort of encouragement in order to rebel, a bit like what happened with the revolt of the earls. They expected the rebellion to work because William was away. Not only that, but if a very poor choice was made in terms of regent, then you couldn't rely on them to do necessarily a good job, and they may dither, not knowing whether they're acting in the king's best interests or not. So an effective regent was incredibly helpful. An ineffective regent could be exactly the opposite. We need to consider too the power of the earls. Remember the earls were a system that were created by King Canute before the time of Edward the Confessor and Edward the Confessor carried this on. William decided to keep the earls as a title but he changed their role quite considerably. In the time of Edward the Confessor this pie chart shows roughly how the power was divided in England. You can consider the king to have had roughly half the power in total, and the top three earls, people like Godwin of Wessex, would have had the rest of the power. So there's a more even balance between the top three earls and the king. Then consider William's system. William had the vast majority of the power, and everybody else had a smaller amount. Consider then that that everybody else section means only a tiny slice of power for each of the people in there. So even the most high ranking nobles in all of England would still have only had a fraction of the power of the king and therefore a fraction of the influence. Power is far less shared in William's England than it was in the time of Edward the Confessor. Your task then. You might want to note down these diagrams to give you a sense of it. Also, explain how the power of the earls changed. And then why would William change this? Thirdly, has anything stayed the same? Pause the video now while you consider these questions. So the power of the earls has changed in that he is quite substantially reduced. When we consider that the top three earls in Edward the Confessor's England had roughly the same combined power as the king himself, all the earls in England, including the minor ones, when combined, did not even have anything like the power of the king, and so their power has vastly reduced. Why would he change this? Well, William was a control freak. He wanted to ensure that the earls didn't step out of line, and so he massively reduced their power. He didn't want anybody competing uh, with him for the throne of England. Remember that this was quite a common phenomenon in Saxon England, where powerful earls could challenge the king and influence him, in uh, William's eyes at least, too much. Has anything stayed the same? Well, let's face it, two things have. Firstly, the earls still exist and they are still incredibly important in England. But the other thing that stayed the same is in both of these cases, the king still has the majority of the power. So the king's power compared to the top three earls might be roughly equal, but that still means that the king has a, a far larger slice of the power than the top three earls. However, that effect has been massively exaggerated by the time of William, who has taken so much power, more power for himself. One of the ways that William expressed his power that's very famous and indeed was very unpopular at the time were the so-called forest laws. A forest was not just an area of woodland, but any area that the king said was for hunting. It could easily be farmland. The English hated the Normans' use of forests, and some of these forests, like the New Forest, were actually created by taking land off the English and turning it over to hunting purposes. Forests had different laws with much harsher punishments. If you were caught illegally hunting in the forests, you could be fined, blinded or executed. You were not even allowed to own a bone, bow or cut down trees without permission. Even gathering firewood could be against the law. Any fines went straight to the king, increasing his wealth and power. Even though the English hated the forest laws, they were utterly powerless to resist and this showed just how powerful William had become. So imagine this situation. An area of forest is set aside, 
This is an area where previously poor people had gathered firewood for free, had set traps and supplemented their diet by catching things like hares and rabbits. Incidentally, rabbits were introduced by the Normans and didn't exist in England before this time. And then after the forest laws, they are unable to do any of these things. It would be almost enough to imagine what if there was someone who could live in the forest and take these things off these evil rich people and give it to the poor who had lost out. That's right, it's really the origin of the Robin Hood legend. The anger that people felt towards the forest laws is reflected in the cultural tradition of Robin Hood. Living in the forest, taking from the rich and giving to the poor rather than not being able to go into the forest at all, not being able to take things for free, and instead having to give everything to the rich. It's the whole idea of the forest laws turned on its head, and surely that's why it's become so popular and such an enduring tale. Your tasks then. Summarise what the forest laws were, what did they involve, and who was particularly affected. Then, explain why the forest laws were so hated. Use point example explain for this. I've given you a brief writing frame if you need it. Thirdly, as a challenge, why was William so determined to keep so much of England to himself? After all, he simply couldn't use all this land himself, and there were many of his possessions that he never even visited. If the text is a little bit too small, make sure that you're watching this in high definition so it's sharper, and make sure you can watch it in full screen if you need to. In the meantime, you can pause the video while you complete those questions. So why was William so power hungry? And why was he so hungry for land? Well, it's worth remembering that in Anglo-Saxon and Norman England, land equals wealth. If the king controls the land, he controls who lives on it and how the taxes are collected and how that is shared out. And that is the ultimate way of sharing out wealth, power and influence in Norman England. And because William was such a power controlling king, he wanted that power for himself, and owning land, even if he never went there, was one way that he was able to keep his dominance over England. We're going to revisit the idea of sheriffs now. Sheriffs and law and order is an important factor in Norman England, and it's one of the ideas from Saxon England that carry, you know, carried over. Remember, the sheriff is also the Shire Reeve. A sheriff came from the Anglo-Saxon Shire Reeve. William liked many of these to be English at the start, but after the rebellions he made them Norman. They were basically the person looking after a domain in each area, so they were expected to follow instructions in writs. These were written instructions from the king. It's the same system they used in Anglo-Saxon times. They were expected to collect taxes and fines that were due to the king, and carry out justice in the king's courts, punishing criminals to show the king's power. They were also expected to raise soldiers for an army wherever this was needed. Your task then. You're going to create a mini job advert for a sheriff laid out like this one on the right. Okay, the star is a bit of artistic license and comes from the Wild West, but you get the idea. Who were the sheriffs? What jobs did they do? And how were sheriffs, sheriffs useful to William? I mentioned the Robin Hood um, uh, uh, legend earlier, and remember that one of the main antagonists or baddies in that story is the Sheriff of Nottingham. It shows how powerful a bad sheriff could be in terms of upsetting people and treating the English unjustly. It's also worth bearing in mind that although William liked the sheriffs to be English to begin with, because it just simply made life easier, eventually they were taken over almost entirely by Normans. So, pause the video now, complete your notes and complete your job advert, and then press play when you're ready to continue. OK, let's move on. Having considered the role of the Shire Reeve, we're now going to consider in more detail the Norman legal system. This did have some things in common with the Anglo-Saxon system, in fact quite a lot of things, so we need to ex assess the extent of continuity, or things stayed the same or roughly the same, and change in this period. In some ways William wanted continuity because he, a complete change in the laws might cause problems and rebellions. However, he still wants to maintain and keep his power. So there were two main changes in the, the legal system under the Normans. One was that the power of the king vastly increased. The second was that the power of the church increased too, because it was an important part of the legal system. Ultimately, the biggest judge in the land was not the king, it was God. On this screen, we're going to consider some examples of the legal system. I'll be honest, this is the sort of thing that I'd usually do as a card sort with a sheet in class, but that's not available to me in, uh, in YouTube unless they invent some way of peeling off the screen and cutting it up. And until they do that, not really possible. So I'm going to have to read out these different cards to you, and you might need to pause it at various points and make the notes that you need to make. <laughs> 
The first change is this. In some areas, there were attacks on individual Norman soldiers. William made a new law that if a Norman was murdered, all of the people in that region had to join together to pay a high fine. This was called the murdering fine. Now, this applied even if it wasn't necessarily a Norman. It just meant that you had to prove that the dead body wasn't a Norman. So this could lead to absurd situations where a dead body is discovered in one village and then in the dead of night it's taken and dumped in another so that the murder and fine would fall on them. Hardly a fair way of governing people, but at the same time, this chaos ensured that the, uh, the Saxons couldn't rise up. B. William kept the majority of Saxon laws. They worked, so he didn't change them. C. The Normans kept the system of tithings and the hue and cry because these were effective ways of policing local communities. Remember, a tithing is a group of around 10 households and they would deal with internal disputes before having to take it elsewhere. The hue and cry, remember, is where you alerted people to a crime and then the rest of the community was expected to, uh, to hunt down and get the, uh, the criminal. D. William introduced the forest laws. We've already had a look at these. Trees could no longer be cut down for fuel or building and people in forests were forbidden from owning dogs or bows and arrows. These are all associated with hunting. Those caught hunting deer were punished by having their first two fingers chopped off. If caught a second time, the punishment was blinding. E. The Normans kept the religious ritual of trial by ordeal, but also introduced trial by combat. The accused fought the accuser until one was killed or unable to fight on. The loser was then hanged, as God had judged him to be guilty. This is it's worth pointing out that the, in trial by combat, you could appoint a champion to fight on your behalf, and the rules remained the same. So this was often an excuse for a big, strong person to beat up someone who wasn't so strong, or indeed for a rich person to hire a professional champion and get rid of someone they didn't like. Hardly fair. F. William used the death penalty for serious crimes and re-offenders. Executions were carried out in public to show the power of the king. Executions had been rare before 1066 when fines had been paid to the offender, to the, uh, rather, uh, to the victim. Think about the Anglo-Saxon system of Weregild, where you would have a system of compensation rather than a system of public executions. G. Norman French became the official language used in court procedures and all court records were kept in Latin. Most English people could not understand either language and so were at a significant disadvantage compared to their Norman counterparts. The justice system was weighed against them. H. William used fines for lesser crimes. However, he ordered that fines should no longer be paid to the victim or their family, but to the king's officials directly. And lastly, I. The Normans introduced church courts. These were separate courts used for churchmen and tended to be more lenient. Basically, a load of, load of priests were unlikely to convict or seriously punish another priest. It's not what you know, it's who you know. Your tasks then. Draw a table or a set of scales with the headings of change and continuity. Remember, change are the things that don't stay the same and continuity are the things that are similar or stay exactly the same. Record the examples above under the relevant headings and are there more examples of change or continuity? And what might this tell you? OK, pause the video now and then afterwards we'll go through and have a look at some answers. OK, hopefully you've worked that out now. A, the merger and fine, is a change. B, is continuity. C, is also continuity. D, is a change. E, is largely continuity, but with a bit of change mixed in. F, is a change. G, is a change. H, is sort of continuity, because remember the system of compensation was kind of what existed in Anglo-Saxon times, but instead it goes to the king, not to the victims. And I, is a change. Well, there's significant change and continuity in here. So you could uh, do the uh, example for number three uh, by looking at the number of examples and making your judgment based upon that, or considering the importance of examples. One of the things I would point out is actually the shortest of all of the, the extracts on here. B. William kept the majority of Saxon laws. That means that although that only counts as one example of continuity, it is a really massive one, because although there are lots of these other changes, the majority of laws stayed exactly the same and people simply wouldn't have noticed the difference. So if you ask me to choose, I'd probably say continuity is more important. We're now going to put this to use in an exam style answer. Here we go. It's an analysis style question and this is how it reads. Explain how William the Conqueror used the legal system to control England. You may use the following in your answer. Merdram and church courts. You must also use information of your own. 
Remember that with a question like this, you've got 12 marks, and that means 6 marks for your knowledge and 6 marks for your explanation and analysis. It is sensible to include both the merger and fines and church courts in your answer, as you're being allowed to do so. However, you cannot limit your knowledge to this, and in fact, you can still get top marks even if you don't mention these two things, if you include enough of your own knowledge. Here's a suggested way of answering it. You'll need to fully explain three examples. Use the system of point, example, explain and link to help you if you need to. So a structure of paragraphs that look a little something like this might be a way of doing it, but you don't have to do it this way. Make a point about what William did to use the legal system to control people. Then give a specific example of how he did this and explain what this meant. Finally, link it back to the question by explaining how this controlled the English people. And if you don't link it back to that idea of control, you're probably not answering the question and you're going to lose lots of the, those AO2 analysis marks. Finally, you'll need to con conclude. Explain the most important example or the overall theme of how William controlled England using the legal system. So a reminder, AO1 for knowledge is six marks and AO2 is for your analysis and interpretation, also six marks. Pause the video now if you want to complete this question and you should spend between about 15 and 18 minutes on doing that. Have a go now. Okay, hopefully that wasn't too difficult, so let's have a look at an example answer and that will give you the opportunity to improve your answer if you need to. For this, I've used a system of colours, so you can see where I've used a point and given an example, explained it and then linked it back to the question. I always consider the bits in purple to be some of the most important ones because there's what those are the bits that are really tying your knowledge back to the question and hitting those more tricky AO2 analysis marks. If the text is a bit small, then by all means you can pause it and look closer, but again, it's probably clearer to play this in HD if you're able. One way that William used the legal system to control England was with fines. For example, the murder and fines specifically punished Saxons who murdered Normans, or rather could not prove that they had not murdered a Norman. This meant that whole communities uh, who would be fined would want to find the true perpetrator. This controlled England by encouraging people to find criminals out of fear of the fines, whilst also discouraging people from harming the ruling Norman class. Another way was through church courts. These were courts that were separate from the, to the separate secular courts, uh, a secular court being one that's not attached to the church, uh, for normal people and only dealt with the clergy. This meant that the church courts were often very lenient. This may not have been fair, but it helped keep the church on William's side. William relied on the church as a crucial way of controlling the people, who, who all believed in the power and authority of religion in their lives. Finally, William kept the majority of Saxon laws. Examples of these include the tithings and the hue and cry. These methods were familiar and kept the responsibility for law and order with small communities. This kept England under control because people were familiar with these laws and mostly agreed with them. Also, introducing too much change may have encouraged rebellion. Overall, William's legal system controlled England through continuity, so I've gone for a thematic approach here. Some laws, like trial by combat and the murder and fine, were new. However, most laws were similar or the same to the Saxon laws that people were already familiar with. This was an effective uh, way. This was effective in controlling England, as William recognised that most Saxon laws were accepted and worked, and so he only needed to introduce new laws to deal with specific threats associated with his rule. And so, hopefully, you've made your mind up by now whether there is more continuity or, or change in Norman law and how uh, William the Conqueror ruled England. But remember this most important point: the power of the king increased. And that power would stay with the king, really, until the English Civil War in the 1640s. That's one heck of a long-term impact, isn't it? And on that note, this lesson is at an end. I'll say thanks very much for taking part. And if you found it useful, please like this video and subscribe to the channel. I'll see you another time. Goodbye.